Well, Yona, we were just talking about meal time at your at your family's house. Can you describe what kind of food your family usually ate? Well, basically, in the 30s, it was a lot of noodles. I think my mom knew how to make at least 10 different kinds of noodles. And that was, uh, and we were poor, but we didn't know we were poor. But she had this thing that uh, she would make coffee for us, and of course it was two-thirds warm milk and, and then coffee added. And uh, I remember having a choice of what we could have for supper one night, and it was either jelly bread and coffee or coffee and jelly bread. Have your pick, and that was it. And that's all there was. And, but other times, if she made donuts, we would have potato soup and donuts for a meal, and that was really great. Or we'd have had what we called placenda and, uh, and potato soup or bean soup, and those were really good meals then compared to the, some of the others. But many times she had noodles and ham made from bread dough, or if she baked, she always had some sort of noodle. We had what we called uh, steam noodles. They were big round noodles, and uh, she'd pour cream over them after they were fried. Oh, gourmet eating! And, or we had uh, a potato, a noodle that she made, and uh, same bread dough, potatoes and onions sautéed before she put the noodles in there, and add enough water to cook them up, and uh, that was wonderful. If we had ham, she'd put ham in there. She was a very, very good cook, and just she could cook a meal from just anything. She made a good, tasty meal no matter what. So what was, what were some of your favorite meals? My One of my favorites was those steam noodles. We call them dumpf noodles. Dumpf is the German word for steam, and uh, that, I would say, was probably my favorite. And what about perhaps your favorite dessert? My favorite dessert, angel food cake. She was the best angel food cake maker you ever had seen. How would she make it? She just had, and I have her old whip that she, that she used for getting the air into the egg whites, and it still is the very best. And what were some of your least favorite meals? My least favorite meal would have been cheese buttons, and I refused to eat them. And so one night my dad said, well, now tonight she's, you're not making her eggs or bread or whatever she likes. She's going to eat cheese noodles. Well, I'm not eating cheese noodles. No way. And I didn't. But then during the night I was so hungry that I went into the pantry and I ate some of those uh, uh, cheese noodles, those cheese buttons we called them. And they had, the dough and had the filling and the cheese buttons. And I ate those and I liked them. But I was so hungry, and I know that they heard me because in the morning he said to Mom, he said, didn't you hear some noise in the pantry last night? You know, and I just, oh, if they knew it. And, you know, I ate the cheese noodles <laughs> or the ch cheese buttons ever since. Love them. So that was uh, a lesson learned. And how would your mom make the filling for the cheese buttons? She had the homemade cottage cheese, of course, and added uh, several eggs and diced onion very, very fine, and a little salt and pepper, and maybe a pinch of sugar, but not usually, sometimes, but not very often. And she would roll out the square. Now, this was not a bread dough, though. This was a noodle dough. And she'd put a dab of that cheese in there and fold it over into a triangle, so it was like a triangle. And then she'd bring the two ends up and put them together and, and pushed them, to, taped them together, so to say, with her fingers. So they looked like little pocket books, you know. So that was pretty neat. And I know that cheese buttons are a typical German-Russian oh, yeah. fair. What, what were some of the other traditional dishes that you could We had potato noodles. If she had mashed potatoes, she would take and, uh, and add uh, eggs and flour and to the right consistency and roll them and roll them with her hand and put them in boiling salt water, and then take them out and fry them in butter. That was a potato noodle. And then my dad made Fleischkegel. And what is Fleischkegel? Fleischkegel is, a, again, a nice pastry dough. Uh, not as rich as the regular pie dough would be, but it was a pastry dough. And he mixed um, mutton and uh, pork together. It was actually not mutton. It was from a younger... Uh, like a lamb, a younger sheep, and onion in it, and salt and pepper, 
and he'd roll out his piece of uh, dough like the size of a saucer and put his, spread his uh, mixture in there and then they deep fried him. Oh, gourmet eating. And that was his thing that he did. The other thing that he made was what they called a grout berucha. And he took and mixed uh, the pork meat or the mixture of pork and beef, whatever he had, mostly pork we had in those days, mixed it with the seasoning and the onion and, and rolled it in uh, this pastry dough and, and baked it. They were baked. Or bread. And for that, they could use either one, the pastry dough or the, the bread dough. And, um, what about dessert? What, did your family ever make ice cream? Oh, yes, we made homemade ice cream. But we didn't have an ice cream maker. We just used like a gallon syrup bucket and put the ice around. It had another pail that we set it into and had the ice around it and the salt on it. And then we kids would just have to turn it. You know, it had a handle on it, so you just turned it until till the uh, turned into ice cream. Would that take long? Not very long. Half an hour, I suppose. Half an hour, 45 minutes. Nothing was too long to wait for that ice cream. And we made butter the same way. I'm deviating from the food product here, but uh, the butter we had in jars, put the cream in jars and just shake it until it was butter. That was our way of making butter until in the more later years we got the butter churn that you turned, you know. So it started out with the jars? Oh, yeah. Was that a common practice? Yes. That's how people made their butter. They shook the cream until it turned into butter. We were happy when we saw that cream separating. How long would you sit there shaking it? Oh, I'd say it'd take at least a half an hour, depending how, how fast you shook it. If you got somebody who was pokey, then it took a long time. You got somebody that really wanted to get the job done, it got done in a hurry. And then my mother would wash the butter, you know, take the butter out of the buttermilk. My dad drank the buttermilk with his noodle dishes, but uh, she washed the butter. And the last rinsing that she did, she put just a tiny bit of soda in it, into the water, and it kept the butter sweet. It never got rancid. So that was a good thing. We had Jello for dessert when Jello finally came along, and she would uh, mix it and she'd hang it in the well, you know. So it was just uh, in the water, just deep enough so it didn't get the water didn't get in. But that was really good. That was a treat. What flavors would she make? Uh, cherry or orange? That's the only two. Well, then she had a lime too, but she did a vegetable salad with that. She chopped up her her. Uh, Carrots and her onions and things, and put them in there. With the jello? Yeah, with the jello. It was green, always green. And Did you like that? yeah, I loved it. Still do. And did your family do their own butchering? Always. Can you describe the, the process for that? Yes, they would uh, stab those hogs, and they'd bring them and scald them in boiling water. And we had. Uh, the pigs, the hog scrapers were like a little round disc with a little handle that they made onto it, and that's how they scraped them. And uh, then, of course, they hung them up and gutted them. You saved the liver. You saved uh, a lot of people saved the blood as they were being stabbed to make blood sausage with. We didn't, but a lot of people did. And then they would hang them cool. And then maybe the next day they'd probably only make the sausage, cut up the hog and make the sausage. Some of them did it the same day, but not likely because there were so many hogs. They usually butchered three or four at a time. That was quite a bit. But you had the neighbors helping you. And then they made their sausage and, and smoked it. Had a smokehouse and smoked it. Hung it in the granary. And that's where it stayed until spring. By spring it tasted. The last few pieces were kind of woody tasting, but oh, they were good. You know, they... They were very good. And the hams we put into the brine, bacon as well, and uh, never had such a thing as pork steaks or pork chops, you know, unless they were just used as fresh, but that all went into sausage meat. But, the, the but they left a little meat on the bones, and then they would cure those bones with the meat on it and cook them with mashed potatoes and sauerkraut. Very good meal. Mm -hmm. We each had our little knife and would pick the meat out from between the joints, you know, and that sort of thing. That was a quiet dinner. Everybody was picking. And, um, oh, I wanted to mention 
some stuff in there. I just I'm sorry. Forgot. Oh, no, I'm back. How would they make the sausage? What would they, they grind it, grind, grind it. the meat, and then they would add the seasoning, the salt and the pepper and, and garlic. We made liver sausage. That had seasoning, but there you added onion to it. And you had to boil that. You had to boil the, the sausage, the liver sausage that was in their casings. They cleaned the stomachs of the pigs and put the head cheese they made, which was like the liver sausage, except you added the pork rinds, ground up the pork rinds and put them in there. And they'd boil those for several hours, and then they would take them out and they'd lay them on a board and press them. And then all the grease kind of came out through that stomach, and then you had the good solid uh, head cheese. You can buy that to this day, but it's never as good as what we had. So. Now, we mentioned a little earlier about your, your father doing some work in the granary. Can you describe what your family's attitude was towards alcohol? My mother never drank. The only one that drank was my dad. Of course, I imagine when the boys got old enough to drink, they probably drank, as they did smoking, you know. But my dad drank. And um, how often would people drink alcohol when you were growing up? Oh, I'd say that there was many times that they, he and the neighbors would drive to town with the horses, you know, the team. And they'd come home pretty drunk, so to say. Um, but everybody was quiet when, they, when that happened. Nobody talked, you know. And did your family make their own root beer? Or beer? Mom made the root beer, yes. Yes, that was so good. How would she make that? She had the flavoring, and then the water and the sugar, and added some yeast. And we had root beer. She also made regular beer. And how would she do that? I don't know how she made that, but she had hops, I think, that she used then or whatever. And the, whatever the grain was that they used to ferment or whatever. But they had homemade beer. Was that a long process? I think that took quite a while. It least, took at least a week to make. Um, now I'm going to move from food and talk a little bit about clothing. Okay. Uh, what types of clothes were common when you were growing up? Little overalls. I wore overalls as well as the boys. And you didn't change every day because you didn't even shower every day. And uh, that's what we wore, especially in the summertime, overalls, and barefooted. And were they store-bought or homemade? No, they were store-bought. Um, and where would, they, where would your parents buy your clothes? In the fall, before we went to school, she'd take the catalog and sit down and order whatever she couldn't make. But as far as shirts were concerned or my dresses, they were all handmade. How often did you get new clothes? Always got a new pair of shoes in the fall when you went to school. And that was what I can remember. They usually lasted the whole year. And if there were hand-me-downs, you got hand-me-downs. Hand I was lucky I was a girl and there weren't any hand-me-downs for me, but the boys, if they didn't wear them out and they got too small, they were handed down to the next one. And did she ever re reuse old clothes to make new ones? Always, absolutely. Especially, like I said, the trousers of dads, they were always turned into shorts. And I did the same thing when my children were little. Took my, their dad's pants and took the backs off and made the little shorts. Would that take a long time? No. Do that? Did you ever have to wear hand-me-down clothes? No, I don't think so. And um, did anyone in your family sew or? My mother. And I learned how to crochet when I was like six years old. And the first thing I had to crochet was a, a little pocket, a little bag to hang on my little arm. Had a little band on it and had to crochet all of that. And then that's where my little spool of uh, crochet cotton went. Then the cat wouldn't get it or whatever. There's my hands again. And were you, uh, what was your favorite? Thing to crochet. I, oh, I crocheted around hankies and around dish towels. That was mainly what I crocheted. And now, how often would you get new shoes? Whenever we needed them, but we really had to need them. But in fall, usually when school started, we got new shoes. In the summertime, they could have holes in them, 
and you just went and put a piece of cardboard in there to cover the hole. And if you could find a piece of old linoleum and cut a sole for yourself, you had some good shoes. So that was a prized possession if you could find a piece of old linoleum. And how many pairs of shoes did you have as a child? That's, I mean, you had a pair of shoes, period. One. Yes. And you polished that Saturday night for church on Sunday. And now I'd like to talk a little bit about technology. Okay. Um, when did your family get electricity? We didn't have electricity on the farm. The stores must have had electricity, a little store in Marshall where we bought most of our groceries. And they, I think they had carbide lime, lights or whatever. And then the white material that was wasted off of there, my mother would take and paint the basement walls with that carbide. I, th I hope I'm saying it right. But that's how she said it, and that's how I'm saying it. And she always had the, and the one room of the basement, she wallpapered with uh, catalog paper or magazine paper, and it was always fresh and clean. And we just enjoyed, you know, even reading the stuff on there. When did your family get its first car or truck? The first car that I remember, we got in 1945, and that was a 35 Chevy. That's the, only, that's the first car that I remember. And did that change? I'll take change? that back. I think it was earlier than 45 because I had started school. Probably 40, 41 probably is when the car I remember. I may not be accurate on that, but. What about a telephone? When did your family get a telephone? We didn't have a telephone. A telephone? Nope. Um, what about the radio? Radio? I don't remember exactly when we got the first radio, but it was the one that had the A batteries, and they could be charged a certain length of time, you know, until they really wore out. And that was my dad's source of getting the news. And he did not like when we played the radio for our dancing on Sunday afternoon because that took a lot of his juice off that battery. And then the last batteries, I remember, they were B batteries. And they were much more efficient, much better. Would you listen to anything other than the news? Yes, only when, the, when Dad and Mom would listen to Fibber, Fibber McGee and Molly. And some of them, Judy and Jane was a show. And... and uh, some of those shows. Um, I'm going to transition here a little bit. I'd like to talk about um, some, some <coughs> activities you may have done when you were a child. We'll talk about things you played or, or games you, did, you played. Um, what, what type of activities did you partake in for fun? Well, there were games that we played. We played cards with each other, or if it was summertime, we played uh, ante over, threw the ball over the building, and then you'd, you know, the other side would catch it and come running and catch us and make us it or whatever. Played tag. That was a winter time. You played uh, fox and the goose, and uh, you know we had every day we rode to the mail in the summertime, but we rode on our stick horses. Each one had a stick horse and, and a binder twine tied around for, for the rain, and away we went. And if you could find a really nice big, uh, like say a fork handle or something, that was a really big horse. And of course, the, my older brother got that all the time, the one next to me. So that was kind of uh, entertainment. And we played a game called Knife. Can you explain that? Yeah, you had the little field of soft dirt that you made. And then, of course, you, you started with uh, going like this with the knife and had a stick in the dirt. The minute you, as soon as you missed landing it in the dirt, then the next person got it. And then the other hand, and then you went on the fingers, and then on the wrist and the arm and the elbow. And the last thing you do was you threw it over your back to make it stick. And whoever could do that first, of course, won the game. And I was telling one of our children about that not so long ago, and he looked it up on the internet, and it still tells you how to do it. Isn't that amazing? So that was a favorite game, was knife. And what kind of activities would you play inside? Mostly checkers. And we had um, 
a game they called drill, and it was moving the beans on the card, you know. If you could get three in a row, then you had a drill, and the more drills you got, up to 12 drills, then that was the end of the game. And there was a board they made in, we made in school. Teacher must have told us how to make it. Those were kind of our games. Summertime, you played hide and go seek. Outside. What was your favorite? I think my favorite was probably just tag. I love tag. Or we played uh, ring around the rosy if there were girls together. Girls like to play ring around the rosy at our summer school or something like that. Or even regular school. Since it was basically you and your brothers, what would you yeah. usually play? Usually played hide and go seek or, you know, tag or something like that. And where did you learn how to play these games? Learned them from mom. That's or school, one or the other. Probably school too. Um, did the weather influence? Oh the yes, games you were playing? yes it did. Where we lived, there were hills all around us, and once the snow settled in, we just didn't go anywhere unless by sled. Went to school with the team of horses and and a sled, a sleigh or sled, and uh, took us every day. My dad would take us to school. How would games change in the winter? In the wintertime, you played inside and it was like button, button, who's got the button? And, uh, or you'd what, hide the thimble. Those were the games we played in our school. And what types of toys did you play with? Dolls. I had dolls. I remember one doll in particular, though. I was six years old, and I got a Shirley Temple doll. It was just the most beautiful doll you've ever seen. And uh, no one else got anything for Christmas that year. But that didn't mean anything to me, you know, whether they got anything or not. I got the doll. And it was maybe only about 20 years ago that my sister told me that the reason I got the doll was because they went along with mom to this to town on the in the wagon or whatever, and they saw this doll. And it was three ninety eight, and they wanted her to buy it so badly for me. Yeah, and um, she said, you know, if I buy that doll for her, there isn't going to be any toys for anyone else. They didn't care, so I got the doll. And, uh, but it, it hurt, I think, to know later that uh, it took so long for me to know that. You know, that's only about 20 years ago that my sister told me that. And your brothers never mentioned it? No. Nobody ever mentioned it. Um, do you still have any of your childhood toys? No. I had the doll until I had the two little boys myself, and my dad said, oh, let those little boys play with that doll. And I did. End of doll. Wish I had it now. Who did you usually play with? I think more or less by myself or Leo. Leo played with me. He was four years younger. Or I had a cousin that was the same age as I was, and if they came over, then we played. You said your father used to play with you and your brothers. What about your mother? Well, I don't remember her playing much with us. She was more like the teacher kind, you know? You sat and heard the Bible stories, learned how to dance, and, and that sort of thing. And uh, where was your favorite place to play? In the kitchen. And why is that? I guess that's where Mom was. That's where she spent most of her time. And the other place that I loved to play was uh, under the steps going down the basement. It was really neat and clean down there, and I had like a little house down there. It was my little playhouse under there. And one area was like a little store. I had all of the empty spice cans that she gave me. And I would play shopping and that sort of thing. You know? We had good imaginations. Did your brothers ever play? Oh, yeah, the younger one did. He played house with me down there, yes. I'd send him to the store. And did you ever play with any of the farm animals? Well, the dog. We had a very good dog, Leo and I, the younger brother and I. We would go sled riding, and, and uh, we'd go down the sled, and the dog would take the sled and pull it back up on the hill. So he was an excellent dog. Do you remember his name? Skip. No, Snip. Sorry. Snip. S-N-I-P. Snippy. And why did he have the name Snip? He was a snippy dog. He, he, just, he just got the name. 
Because he was so lively from as a tiny puppy even. Do you know what kind of dog he was? Yeah, he was part collie. That's all I know. What other was, I don't know. Now, when you were a child, did you have any favorite rhymes or sayings? Oh, we sure did. Can you remember any we, of All of our little German prayers. And I taught them all to my granddaughter, too. Like, Engel kum, mach mich frum, als ich zu dir in die Himmel nei kum. Angel, come, make me holy, so that I can enter heaven with you. And the other one was, Ich bin klein, mein Herzl ist rein, soll niemand drin wohnen aus Jesus allein. I'm small, my heart is clean, and no one can live in it but Jesus alone. Then we had one that was longer. It was, in Gottes Namen schlafen gegangen, zwei zwei Engel mit mir gegangen, zwei zu Kopf, zwei zu Fuß, zwei Linke, zwei Rechte, zwei decke mich, zwei wege mich, zwei führe mich in das himmelbare Dies. Dies. Da steht der Baum, was mich betraut, von dem Besentraum. Geh weg, oh weg, du Beser Geist, du hast kein Dahl an meinem Fleisch, du hast kein Dahl an meinem Blut, dass mir kein Mensch nichts mehr Beses tut. I think that was the end of it. And what is that one? It was... Uh, in God's name I go to sleep, 14 angels go with me, two to my head, two to my feet, two to my left, two to my right, two to cover me, two to wake me. That must be 14. Thank you for sharing that. You're welcome. And um, did you have any superstitions or scary stories that, that you can recall? No, but my mother was a real prankster. She liked to, uh, our two oldest boys, my two older brothers went out on Halloween one night. And uh, and then she and I stuffed a pair of long underwear of my dad's and hung them downstairs in the doorway outside. And when they put their horses away and they came walking toward the, toward the house with their flashlight, they saw this thing hanging there. And oh my God, they just screamed and hollered, Dad's hanging in the doorway. And we were upstairs looking out the window, kind of snickering and laughing. And, uh, oh, he said, that's a dummy, one of the boys. That was a joke. And what were your favorite songs as a child? Oh, we just sang so many of them. Like the, I think my favorite was that one about those little children, actually. Um, and you mentioned that most of your family sings. Um, how young were you when you started singing? Oh, I was just little mm -hmm. when we sang. Did you sing anywhere other than in, at home? Sang in the country church choir or in school, you know. That was about it. <clears throat> My dad sang for weddings, he and his sister. And were you, were you ever encouraged to play an instrument? No. Well, is there anything else that you'd like to share about your childhood pastimes? Unless I think of something. Now we'll talk a little bit about chores Ooh. that you've done. Yes. Little. Can you please tell us about the chores you did as a child? We would gather eggs, feed the chickens, feed the pet lambs, milk the cows. By the time I was eight years old, I was milking cows before I went to school in the morning. And when we milked our cows, they just stood in the corral. Wherever they stood, they stood. And if you didn't milk them fast enough, they walked off on you. So it was like you milk your better milk. And uh, had turkeys and chickens and ducks and geese. And, and that was kind of, in summertime, we had to herd the sheep. And most of the time, we didn't. Pardon me? We took them out really early in the morning, like way before sunrise. Maybe five in the morning, you know, and, and then by 10 o'clock we'd bring them in because they, they were full and they wouldn't stay out there in that heat. They'd come in and lay behind the house or someplace. Did, you, did your family have a lot of sheep? Yes, yes, we always had sheep. I suppose a couple hundred. I remember my dad, we had a sheep buck in the group, of course, one or two probably, and he would always catch my dad and just bump him really hard. So he really got angry with him one day and he picked up a two by four and was going to just 
swat him one. Instead, he hit, a, hit one of the ewe, ewes and killed her, one of his best female sheep. So we always listen to that story. He never did that again? No. <laughs> never. And what were any other outside chores that you... Well, milking was a big thing. We had to milk all the time and bring the milk in and separate and feed the calves and you just you just did all the, the chores that needed to be done. Feed the hogs. It, in the fall we'd shell corn and keep it in the barn upstairs in bags, sacks, and, and that was fed to the hogs to fatten them up and spring they'd grind some for the chicks and that sort of thing. Why? We were talking about some of the chores you did in the fall, like shelling corn. What other kinds of chores would you do during harvest time? Went out and uh, picked corn. Helped with that. I never went out and did much in the fields. I was a house girl, but I know that the boys did. And uh, they would pitch bundles. They'd, they'd shock the wheat, the grain, put it into shocks. And then they would have to help with the harvest when the threshing crew came. I remember helping with the cooking for the threshing crew. They came for breakfast. And there had to be like a huge breakfast of potatoes and meat and, and that sort of thing. I think it was like baking bread almost every day because they ate so much bread. Mom was a good bread maker. And the cooking was horrendous, I thought. But she had, uh, if they had sheep in the summertime or in the fall. I don't remember just when they did it, but she'd can a lot of mutton. And then we had mutton that she made gravy with and potatoes and that sort of thing. So always had always had enough to eat. And you mentioned some that you were a house girl. What, what chores did you do inside the house? I had to clean, you know, yeah. I learned how to scrub a floor and I learned how to do dishes and I learned how to wash clothes. and. And uh, learned everything the mother knew. Can you describe the uh, clothes washing process? Well, I would just help with uh, sorting them. I remember when she got her first washing machine. I was just a kid. And uh, it was one that you uh, had a gas motor on it. And she learned how to turn the governor or whatever was on there to open the gas and that sort of thing. And, and she was like in her glory when she got that one. Before that, I'm assuming that that's when I saw her washing with the washboard and a tub. And we had to break our water because it was so very hard. So she'd, we'd carry it into a ba uh, barrel the night before. And then she'd put two or three teaspoons of lye into it. In the morning, that lye would have brought all the alkali to the top. She'd skim it off and then heat it for washing. So then we had soft water to wash with. They were so clever, and she had all that homemade soap. How often would she do the laundry? Usually once a week. We didn't have that many clothes. I remember Dad having one white shirt, and he wore that to church, and it got hung back in the closet for the next time, and maybe the next time before you washed it. I learned how to iron it, though, with the flat irons. We had flat irons, and then finally we got a uh, high test gas iron and that and my mom taught me how to use that and I was just a kid of 10 or 11 I guess she could trust me so learned how to use the gas iron and did you ever burn anything oh I yes we had to iron like pillowcases and dish towels and everything and I remember burning a dish towel with a flat iron though it was off the stove did you get in trouble no not really it was gone. Now, did you help care for your, your family's garden? You said you had a small one, but did you help with the big one? Oh, always. We had to weed, and we had, as I said, we took the weed to the hog fence and stuff them in sacks, you know, and, and, uh, and we had a thin like the carrots. And, but all around my, about half of my mom's garden, she had four o'clock flowers, which grew to be about like two feet tall. It was beautiful. She loved flowers just as much, and we had a fence around our house, and she had a flower garden there. How big would you say her garden was? Oh, her garden? Oh, my goodness. 
eighth of an acre, I suppose. <laughs> it was a huge garden, but it had the potatoes in it as well. So, and watermelons. And did your brothers, did they ever help around the house or with the garden as well? They helped with the garden, but I don't remember helping, that they helped with the house. And where did, where did your mother hang the clothes in the winter? We hung them in the house. We had lines strung from one end of the house to the other. And then she had uh, sort of a rack that was made, and she'd put that right on top of the big register. You know, we had a big, huge register that heated the entire house. So the, the heavy towels that she had, she'd put on there, and they would dry real fast and give us moisture in the air, I suppose. You mentioned a little bit that your mother did help in the fields. Can you describe that a little bit more? Yes, she did. She always had to help with the harvesting. It was limited to harvesting. And that's when she went out and she set the header stacks. The headering was a, used a machine that cut off the heads of the grain, you know, with probably three inches or four inches, whatever they had with it. And, and, uh, and then she would set those stacks so that they, it wouldn't rain into them. She made them like a loaf of bread on top, you know, rounded. And that was her job. She went along when they went to the neighbors and, and harvested and did it for them. Was she still able to get food on the table like normal while she was doing I think so. I remember that I did a lot of cooking. You know, she'd tell me what I had to make, and, and that's what you did. And were there any chores that you liked or disliked more than the others? I liked, like, gathering the eggs. That was fun. But I didn't mind any of them. I mean, there wasn't such a thing as saying, I hate this. You just knew it was a part of your life. You just did it. I loved feeding the pet lambs and that sort of thing. That was well, can always... Can you describe how you would do that? We would... Uh, my mother would take um, old inner tube tires, uh, inner tubes from the tires, and she would shape them so that she would sew them up the side by hand with a thread and make a nipple out of them. And that you pulled over a pop bottle or whatever kind of bottle you had, usually a pop bottle, and that's what you fed the pet lamb with and uh, raised your pet lambs. How many of those were there? Oh, there were, oh, we always had like 10, 15 pet lambs. Some of the mothers wouldn't take them, and, and then, or they had twins. They could only handle one. You, Dad would see that they didn't have an udder big enough to feed two of them, or enough milk to feed two, so he'd take one away and we'd raise it with a bottle. As it got bigger, we just had to give it two, three bottles full of milk, and, and then they would bump, you know. They were just like they were nursing, and a bottle would fly, and you'd probably fly, and it was funny. And how often a day? How many times a day? Three times a day. Well, when they were really, at first we fed them like six times a day because they were so little and couldn't have much at a time, you know. Sometimes you even used a nectar bottle, you know, which is just a small bottle. And, and, uh, but as they got a little bigger and stronger, it got to be more and more. So pretty soon you had a pop bottle. And, that's what you fed them with. Did you ever have to feed any calves like that? Yes, calves too, sure. Mm -hmm. If you had a calf that didn't uh, drink out of, the, out of the pail right away, you know, and then when you first you gave them the, that, and the, or you'd give them your fingers to suck on, and then slowly you'd kind of move the fingers apart, and they'd suck the milk up through your fingers. Mm -hmm. Oh, fed many a calf that way. That was for sure. Now, was there a difference between winter chores and summer chores? I think there was. We didn't have any uh, pet lambs, you know. And the chickens probably laid better in the wintertime because they were cooped up and they were really, we had a very nice into the earth chicken coop built into the earth and it was always warm in there and we had a lot of eggs. How many chickens did you have? Oh, probably 150. So how many eggs would, would you usually have? Well, I'd get? say half of them. Usually they laid an egg every other day, I think. About 75 oh, yeah. Time. Oh, yeah. Take them to town and trade them for groceries. How much would, would you say you earn with that many eggs? Oh, I suppose they were 10 cents a dozen, 25 cents a dozen sometimes. And how many groceries would that buy? Buy you enough. Uh, it would buy you the bread and the, I mean, the sugar and the coffee and the tobacco 
and the matches, kerosene for the lamps, the staples, and oatmeal. And oatmeal. Oh yeah, oatmeal was a oatmeal and cream of wheat were the breakfast cereals. And it's funny that each kid had it had their own bowl, and the bigger boys had much bigger bowls than we did. You know, and I was when I was little, I I always I wanted to say eat meal. And of course, the boys laughed at me because I said eat meal. And I said, well, that it's surely not oatmeal. It's got to be eat meal. What is oatmeal? Um, we haven't talked a lot about school, so I think we should. Um, what did you want to be when you were growing up? I wanted to be a sister. And when did that change? I suppose it changed when I went to high school. Where did you go to school? I, as a, in grade school, rural school, big flat school, until it burned down, and then they divided it into small, two smaller schools, one on the east end and one on the west end. And how did you usually get to school? Wintertime with the sleigh and horses. Summertime, we walked. It was like two miles. Mm -hmm. What, what were your schools like, like classroom size? And the big flat school that we had was a big school. In fact, they actually had one year, I think, of high school there. And they had divided it into two, the, the lower grades on one side of the structure and the higher grades on the other side. And uh, we always had excellent teachers. How many teachers were there? There was one for... I would say there was one for the lower grades and one for the higher grades. And probably two for the lower grades and two for the higher grades. But most of the time it was just one, I think, if I remember correctly. And did they, did you have to have any supplies for school? Sure, tablet and paper. The books were supplied and colors. And what was the, what kind of, um, what was the school population like? Was it more males, more females? Or? Yeah, I think that was half and half. And what about other ethnic groups? No, we didn't have other ethnic groups in our school. Um, I think our teacher was, one teacher that I remember was French, so she was, you know, darker colored than we were, but uh, Russo was her name, her last name, and I think it meant running water, if I remember correctly. And can you describe what the attendance was like? The attendance was good. Most of the time, very good. Unless it was springtime, then some of the boys had to stay home and help, and that sort of thing. And at times, did you have to stay home? No. no. Not at that time? Never. Education was important to my mother. And what is your favorite memory about going to school? What is my favorite memory about going to school? Let me see. Well, it certainly wasn't the lunch, because that was like a syrup bucket, and, and your sandwiches were uh, syrup and peanut butter, but mostly syrup, and it kind of soaked through the bread. Until the last few years, when just Leo and I went, then we had better sandwiches. We had like um, deviled egg sandwiches, and we had Friday, she'd take uh, sardines and mix them with cream and salt and pepper. Excellent sandwich. And so we were treated a little better when, when there weren't so many of us. But uh, the favorite thing, I think, was probably the, the social aspect of it, is being out with the other kids. My favorite topics were always the English and the arithmetic. Those two were my favorite, math and English. So were you a good student? I was average. I had some of each, A's, B's, and C's. And did you, did you have a lot of homework? No, we didn't have much homework. And what would you usually have homework in if you did? If we did have homework, arithmetic okay. and spelling. We always had spelling to and take did your home. did your parents or siblings ever help you if you had some I think my mom probably asked us to spell words. Dad didn't because he couldn't read them. But... Uh, I don't remember the siblings helping. You were pretty much on your own. 
Did you ever get into trouble? In school? No. I sure didn't. And what language did you speak there? English. Would you get in trouble if you spoke anything other than English? I don't think so. But when by the time I went to school, everybody was speaking English, you know. And did you ever change from a country school to a town school? Not grade school, no. Now what about high school? High school, I went to Richardson, to St. Mary's. Would have loved to have gone to Halliday, but my dad said, you want to go to school, you're going to stay with the sisters. End of story. And why was that? Because I think he just thought it was a better school and it was, you were controlled, you know. It was just a, a Catholic school. If he could afford to send you to Cal he didn't want you going to the, and the other thing I think was because the public school in Halliday was probably two-thirds non-Catholic, and they didn't want you to mix, although he mixed, but uh, they didn't want you to mix with the Lutherans or non-Catholics. That was a big issue. Now, would, would these different religious groups, would, would they mix at, say, dances and such? Yeah, they would, but you didn't go dating them. Mm -hmm. So you could dance together, you just oh, yeah. could not date? No, you could not date. Um, so what social activities were there during your time in high school? Not many, you know. We had just started to play basketball, and I was too big a klutz to do that. But they did have like a CYO. You know, uh, what is it, Catholic Youth Organization. For the day scholars that I remember, they had ice skating and, and things. Um, but we border people didn't get to do any of that. We stayed with the sisters. Now, when you were at the dating age, can you, can you kind of describe what activities were common? Or Dances. To do at that time, so. Oh, yeah. If you could get somebody to go to the dance with, it was always a group. You never went alone with, with just one person. But many times you took your lunch along for midnight. You know, the boys would take the lunch along. The boys would take the lunch? Mm -hmm. for, for both of you? Yeah. And what kind of dances did they have? Well, they had um, just waltzes and polkas and... And the two-step. And who would they get to play the music? They always had a band of some kind. It was always live music. Always. And what instru instruments? Were Accordion, they mostly. And there, there's, there are different kinds of dances or locations for dances. Did you go to barn dances as well as ones in town? No. I probably went to one barn dance in my life. The other was like at, the, at a city hall. And I didn't go to many dances. And my parents were pretty careful as to how many times I got to go to a dance. Um, so were you involved in any clubs when you were younger? Not really. Mm -hmm. um, what about going to the movies? Only when I went to high school did I get, a, get to go to movies when I stayed with my aunt. And how old were you when you started dating? Oh, my goodness. I suppose I was like 16 when I, like the first guy, <laughs> you know. And can you describe a typical date? You went to a dance or a movie. That was about it. Do you remember any of the movies you saw? Yes, like Gone with the Wind. And not many that I remember. <clears throat> in, in your opinion, how are the customs of courtship different than they are today? Oh, my goodness. Very different, I would say. Very different. How so? For one thing, we dress so modestly, which you don't see anymore. And, you know, and, and the language that, we watched every word. We didn't have a vulgar language when we did it. 
And now it's like as common as saying your prayers almost. And times have so changed. And I'm sure there, there are just as many good things about the dating as there are not. But it was pretty strict, our dating. So were you chaperoned a lot? Not really. I went with my brother, you know, that he took me. But I, not, well, there were always more than just us. You know, there were always two, three couples that went rather than just go alone. What was the attitude of the older generations towards dance halls? I think they had more house parties and more uh, barn dances. Actually, the barn that's setting out here is where they, uh, my husband's brother had his wedding dance, you know, up in the hayloft. And, um, anything else that you would care to add about um, youth activities or... We went to a lot of shows. Saturday night was a show night when I was old enough to date, you know. But when I stayed with the sisters, even if I wrote a letter to a boy, <clears throat> it'd have to be left open so they could read it. They were so strict. You laid it on the windowsill so they could read it. And then I got a return letter. I remember one time I got a return letter from a boy, and they sent it home to my parents. Yeah, look what she's doing. She's writing a letter to these boys, to a boy. Did you get in trouble? No, because I went home that same Friday night, and I got it out of the mailbox. So they never, ever knew. <laughs> I'd like to talk a little bit about the environment and what it was like growing up on the plains. Can you tell us what it was like for you growing up on the plains? Well, I think it was very interesting. I know that in the springtime, April came and we were out there picking crocuses. And that was just a most delightful time. Each one would see who could bring the biggest uh, arm or handful of crocuses into the house. And they were just so pretty. And then, of course, after that came lambing time and... Uh, and that was a nice time. You'd see those little lambs playing on the side of the hill. Oh, it was just so beautiful. And that's how things would go. And then there were, during the 30s, it was different, too, because I remember how, the parent, how our parents worried about the dirty 30s. They, we were poor, and they had no crops, and it was just very, very hard to keep the cattle alive and, or to have good milk cows or whatever. And... At one time, I know that there was, they were all looking up into the sky, and it was so dark up there, and it was like the, a shadow or whatever, and, and they said it was the, the grasshoppers were that heavy, that they clouded the sun. And so that was scary. And then I had my older brother tell me that there were sand dunes, you know, the wind blew and it was dirty, and sand dunes as high as telephone posts, they said, and... There were just so many things. Wheat was like 20 cents a bushel, and it just had no price, but then there wasn't much to sell either. So there were, you heard the, the hardships that the parents were having. You know, you could feel that. But we always had enough food. We never went away hungry, and that was the good thing. And then there came a time when they had a relief program, and you could get... Uh, Oh, different commodities from the relief. But then somebody must have been jealous of my dad or whatever, and he wrote to the county office and said, we were milking five cows and did not deserve to have that program. And, of course, we lost it then because we were milking five cows. So I guess that was supposed to take care of all your needs. They said if you had a cow, you had milk and you had cream and you had cheese. A lot of byproducts from the cow. And you had your beef if you killed her, but you wouldn't do that. And so it was. And did you find, was there, what did you find beautiful about growing up on the plains? I guess the, it was the, the peacefulness, the serenity. Where we lived, there were hills all around us. There was very seldom did you see anybody coming as, as an agent. or that. We had a gypsy one time. I remember him coming. And Mom told us to get in the house, the gypsies were coming, you know, and that sort of thing. But uh, 
they came with their little knapsack on their back and and I don't know what they wanted, maybe food or something, or sell some of their wear. They had some kind of beaded necklaces or something, and Mom didn't have money, but they went on their way then, you know. What did you think of the gypsies? Well, they were, they were scary. You know, they had those turban kerchiefs around their neck, heads, and and uh, rattling stuff, and so it was kind of scary to see them come. But then we also had a extension magazine salesman that always came and he was so nice he always brought us gum which was such a treat always had a pack of gum with him which we hardly ever got you know because parents didn't buy much of that so there were different things that were so enjoyable and then again there were things that were hard and what were what did you find unpleasant about it i think there really wasn't that much unpleasant about the whole thing you know, we didn't see anybody that had better than we did. We were, we were, they told us, I mean, they tell us now that we were so poor, but we never realized that we were poor. I think everybody was as poor as we were. And so it didn't really matter. We were happy. And I guess the happiness outweighed the sadness. There was a lot of prayer. We never missed a mass if we could possibly help it. And that was always uplifting. You know, carried you on another week. And uh, the same way, like during Lent, you know, the rosary was said every night. And prayer was very, very important in our lives. And where did your family go to church? To St. Martin's Church, which is south of Dodge, or it was west of, east of us. And we had weekly services. Did they have seating arrangements in that church? Oh, sure. They had pews mm -hmm. and had a choir. Oh, yeah. We sure did. And then the man that lived closest to it, he was the caretaker. Did you know him well? Very well, yeah. And what was his name? Sanger, Val Sanger. S-E-N-G-E-R. And was he an older gentleman? Well, to me, he was very old at that time. <laughs> he was, I suppose when he took care of the church, he was probably in his 40s, you know. But uh, he's not here anymore now, but... Uh, I can't believe how old those people were when we were kids. And uh, what were some of the religious activities that you participated in? Oh, well, during Lent, it was Stations of the Cross once a week that you attended. And you had, like, uh, services on Ash Wednesday and Good Friday. And other than that, the, the service was at home. You knelt every night and said the rosary or whatever. You never, that was extra prayer that you said during Lent, was that Holy Rosary. When were you baptized? I was baptized in 1929, year I was born, probably probably a week after I was born. And what about your confirmation? That was, I was, I was eight when I received my first communion, and then I suppose 12 when I was confirmed, 12 or 13. 12, it must have been 12, because by 13 I entered high school. Where did, uh, At St. Martin's Church is where we were baptized, communion, and confirmed. And, and the, what was the process for confirmation? The bishop came out and uh, lays his hands over you and received the Holy Spirit. And that makes you a soldier of Christ. Go profess the, the faith that you have. And did you have to wear anything specific for that? Not necessarily, but for the first communion, which was when we were eight, we had uh, white dresses and veils and went in a group. And how big was your group? Oh, 12. And did you have to take classes leading up to your first? Sure. Every summer we had uh, religious training for two weeks. And was that what it was called? It was called uh, catechism school. Went to catechism school. And that was all of the whole parish, you know, all of the children of the parish. And we went to church. We, we never, uh, never sat with your parents when you went to church. You sat up in the front pew. They were in the back someplace. But you knew to behave. Did you or your brothers ever get into trouble <laughs> in church? I, well, if they did, there was one man behind us that uh, they called him the church father, and he would just pull their ears. 
He was absolutely watching him, watching all of us. And who taught you at the, uh, at the catechism school? Nuns. They had nuns come out from Minnesota, from St. Joe's in Minnesota, two weeks span, and they stayed with the neighbors that were close to the church. And where did you, where did you stay when you were at school? We went back and forth. Home yeah, school. yeah. Okay. Drove with the wagon, usually, or walked. How far was it? Well, that was like about three miles. Did you have to wear anything specific for, for the school? No, but everybody wore just little overalls and shirts or whatever. <laughs> that was kind of our uh, attire. And when you were confirmed, was there a celebration? Not in particular, no. And were you able to question any religious teaching when you were young? When, you, when I went to school, you mean, to catechism? Well, or when, any time, when you were a child? No. There wasn't such a thing as questioning anything the, the adults had told you. That was it. It was written in stone. And what did your parents restrict you from doing because of religion? Well, for one thing, you couldn't eat meat on Friday. And the other thing, you couldn't... Uh, you couldn't take part in any non-Catholic services. That was out. You couldn't even as much as be a bridesmaid for anybody else in, in their church because that would say that you were acknowledging that their faith was the right faith. And we as Catholics, you know, we thought we were the, you know, only faith. And I j now I just say all roads lead to Rome. No matter which faith you have, you can trace it back to Rome. So, in, a, in your home, was a Sunday meal different than any? Yes, other? it was always chicken noodle soup on Sunday. And why chicken noodle soup? That was the Sunday dinner, <laughs> and you never knew when the priest was coming. Sometimes he would just pop in, and when he came, you said, "Praise be Jesus Christ, good morning, Father," or "Praise be Jesus Christ, good afternoon, Father." That was the title with which you addressed him. Would he, did he visit your house? Sure, frequently? sure. He probably came once every three months or four months, made the rounds, saw everybody. And when he came, we were just happy as could be. You know, Father's coming, Father's coming. And we had the chicken noodle soup. And was that, um, what was the typical meal for a church celebration? Church celebration would have been fried chicken, the chicken noodle soup, first of all, and then the fried chicken and mashed potatoes, coleslaw, vegetable, and a relish. That was already then. The relish, of course, consisted, if it was in the fall, just the pickles and tomatoes and things, garden things. And was this, was your church the nearest one? Our church was the nearest one to us, yes. And was the German language used in church worship? Yes. Church? When I made my first confession, I did it in German. Until what year did that change? Until what year? I imagine... I don't know how long they did. I suppose maybe two years after that they probably changed to English because we had a, a priest come that, uh, that did English homilies. So I'd say I was probably one of the last ones that went to confession in German. And how did your family respond and react towards death? Towards death? Mm -hmm. Well, they, they, would, you know, they didn't embalm them in those days. And so they just had a wake and they stayed with the body all night long. Somebody stayed with that body all night. And uh, that was kind of how it was. Loaded them up on a wagon box and took them to the cemetery and had the church service and buried them there. And how did your family view other faiths? Other faiths? Well, I don't think that they ever said that that faith was not a right faith or that it was not a good faith, but they wouldn't let us intermix either. We could, we could visit those people, yes, but don't you be dating him. My dad said every hog stays at his own trough. He had so many of those expressions, it was unreal. Do you remember any others? Any others? Yeah. When you were, when, say for instance, he was, he was going to make something or build something, and it probably would cost more than what he had anticipated. Well, he'd finally say, you know, if you can get over the dog, you can get over the tail. Simple as that. And he'd go on with his project, whatever he had to do. So those were the, that was the way he would explain it?
explain things. Yeah, that's how he would explain his his idea or his philosophy, you know. Did you ever question those? No, never, never really even comprehended what he was saying until, you know, as we get older. Well, now I come around with all those old expressions, and the, our kids just love them, you know, and repeat some of them too. One of the others was, um, each man carries his own hide to the market. So beware of that, and that's how you live accordingly. Each man carries his own hide to the market. And I'm going to move a little bit from religious teachings and practices to farm life. And we've talked about it a little bit before. Um, but I, I was wondering if you could describe the farmstead that you grew up on. I love the farmstead that I grew up on. Uh, we had a creek running right close to the to the house, to the house and barn. A big water hole just out down from the barn, a little ways down from the barn. And the last thing the parents would say before they leave, stay out of that water hole. It's deep. And I remember so well. They were probably just barely over the hill and the boys were getting their clothes off and going into the water hole. And then we, you know, didn't dare to tell, you know, because you'd have got another licking. And I, I remember that so well. And then the other side of the farm where there were, it was a creek too, and we had a coal mine. And they mined coal out of there for many years. And they dug it all out by hand, you know, and shovels or whatever they had. And, and the neighbors and we had coal from there. And around the coal mine were a lot of Juneberry bushes. Oh, the Juneberry bushes. We had Juneberries and more Juneberries and uh, choke cherries. We had to go into the, to a rancher's fence to get the wild plums, but we did. And where was the closest town to your homestead? The closest town was just a little, uh, not even a village, not even big enough, I don't think it'd be, well, a village maybe, but was Marshall. And mom would go with the team and a buggy or a small wagon and go and do her shopping there. That was Marshall. That was a uh, cross country, like a mile and a half. And then the closest big town would have been Halliday. And once or twice a summer, maybe we got to go to Halliday. And then the women and the uh, women did their shopping and sat in the stores until the bars closed. That's when the dads came out and then we went home. Was that just the typical? That was typical. That's how it went. That's how it was. It wasn't just our family. It was, we ran the streets or played or whatever, and, and the mom sat in the grocery stores and visited until the men came and, and we all went home. And did, growing up on the farm, did you ever experience isolation? I think in the wintertime I felt like that. As I got older especially, I wanted out of there so badly because there were hills all around us. You never saw, we, it was like, not a civilized area to me. It was like wilderness because there were hills all around us and they were all full of snow and the winters were hard and, and uh, yeah, felt like you were isolated from civilization. So when I got to be 13 years old and was allowed to go to high school, I went. Happy to go to school. And would you, um, do you know how your family gained possession of the land that they were on? Yes, I think a part of it he homesteaded, my dad homesteaded or homesteaded another parcel a little farther away and then bought this one. But he was very, very, uh, he was a very, very good businessman and he managed to keep his land when depression came and a lot of people were losing their land. And, but the uh, bank out of Minneapolis are the, are the people that helped him and told him how to, how to manage that, that uh, he was able to keep the five quarters that he had and had him forever, and uh, he, he, was very, he couldn't speak English, but he had a way of uh, communicating. It didn't matter. I imagine those people probably talked, spoke German as well at that time. And what kind of farmers, or what kind of um, farm would you consider your family had? Grain farming? Grain farm. Just grain farm. Definitely. 
and a, a lot of pasture. It's diversified. And what kind of buildings were on the farm and what were they used for? Well, the barn was used for the cattle or the horses, didn't matter, either one. And then we had the, had the sheep in the same barn. It was a huge barn. As far as I know, it wasn't kept up like with paint. Apparently, it probably would have cost too much to paint it. I don't know. And other than that, all we had was another little, uh, a little a brooder house. And I think we had one granary. That's all that I can remember ever having on that farm. And then they built that chicken coop into the, into the hill. It was such a clever idea. And, you know, so warm in there at wintertime. Really warm. Didn't need any heaters. And you mentioned before some of the animals that your family had. Um, yeah, there we, any more that you can... we had horses, cows, pigs, chickens. We, with the sheep you, and sheep, and we always had uh, a goat with a sheep, a billy goat with a bell on it. Keep the coyotes away. And that was the reason for that. And uh, had like turkeys. Oh my goodness, turkeys, that was some project all right. We, Mom raised a lot of turkeys, and in the fall, they would uh, kill the turkeys, defeather them, but leave their heads on. And then they were crated and sent to Minneapolis to the Fox Brothers in big crates. And that was always interesting because the neighbors would get together and they'd do our turkey group of turkeys one time and then, then next week they go do the other and it was feather pulling time. So a lot of the, the neighbors had turkeys as well? Oh yes, yes. And I remember they fed them sour milk and oatmeal when they started them, you know. Smelled terrible, but that's what they did. Was that, was that to fatten them up? Then? No, that was to start them out. That was their starter mm -hmm. until they were big enough to eat grain. It was oatmeal and uh, sour milk. What a combination. Um, and can you describe the roads that led out to this farm? Oh, the roads, yeah. I can describe the roads all right. If there was mud or rain or snow, you didn't drive any roads. There were no roads to drive then. Otherwise, there, was a, there were trails, you know, but they were not graded up roads. Not in our area. So like a two-track? Yeah, track, track where they drove all the time. Okay. That's what it was. And what type of farming equipment did the family have? Oh, he had, we had like a plow and a drill and uh, horses for the most part. The last few years they had a tractor. But uh, other than that, it was all with the horses. And one of my jobs as a kid was to pump the water and have the tanks full of water where the ho it came in with the horses at noon. And if you forgot about it, it was not nice. And, yeah, I got in trouble then. Just scolded, you know, because it did. Uh, it, the horses were thirsty and they would stand and they'd chop at that trough or whatever and there was no water in it, you know. And you had to pump it by hand. So that was the horse story. And what kind of, do you remember the, your neighbors? Oh, very well. And who were they? Schumachers were our close neighbors. Leffelbeins were the other. And Krenzels were the other. Oh, and Laps. There was a lap. And how close did they live to your farm? Oh, about a, a mile. Either Each one was a different direction. About a mile. And did they ever look after you or your siblings when your parents were gone? No. no. Um, I would say if anybody did, the Schumachers probably did. They were the closest to us and we would probably stay with them until the parents had come home or something if, if they doubted about when they would get home. And then they'd just pick us up on their way home. But the thing about the Schumacher family, every year on, Jan on July the 26th, uh, they would make homemade ice cream because it was the, their daughter's birthday who was the same age as I was. And we'd always have that homemade ice cream. That was the day then that they cleaned out their ice house. They had an ice house. And they, they had ice all summer long until July 26th, and then it was gone. And they kept that ice by covering it with straw. It was kind of built into the uh, ground, too, the earth. And then they uh, chopped these big squares of ice. They cut squares of ice and brought it up and put it in their ice house in the wintertime, and it stayed till July. 
So they they were really good. And after that, there was no more ice after cream. After that, there wasn't any more ice cream. <laughs> but that was longer than any of us at home had it, you know. So was neighboring common practice then? Yes. Can neighboring. you explain it? Yes. If, if, many times we got to stay with their with their children when they when the parents went away and our parents would go together. Neighboring was great, and they were our greatest neighbors. Uh, my mother was an excellent, excellent seamstress. She could cut a pattern from newspaper for a dress or anything you wanted, and the neighbor there, the neighbor lady there, Mrs. Schumacher, couldn't. And so she'd call my mother or tell my mother to come and cut some patterns for her girls, and she had a lot of girls, and my mother would cut a pattern the size that she thought should fit. If it didn't fit one of them, it would fit the next. And then from there, they'd go farther. So, so oh, yeah, those neighbors loved my mother. I mean, the neighbor lady there loved my mother because she was so helpful to her in so many ways. My mother was very talented. And what, when you, whenever you did go to town um, in your town visits, did the town kids treat you differently because you were raised on a farm? Mm, I don't think so. We didn't know the difference. And they probably weren't running the streets like we were. We came to town, they were probably home in bed, you know. And what, in your opinion, were positive aspects of growing up on a farm? Pardon me? The positive aspects of growing up on a farm? Oh, I think you just learned a lot of responsibility growing up on a farm. And uh, I think you learned how to communicate with people too because you were so happy to see people when they did come to see you that you had all the respect in the world for them. We called every woman and man uncle and aunt. That was just how it was. Parents would say go give it to that uncle or go give it to that aunt. And uh, that's just how it was. We had a lot of respect for, for people, for one another. And we learned that from little on. that. Uh, our elders were to be respected. There was no question about, about it at all. Yeah. And I think we learned to be independent as well. We didn't have to depend on the grocery store very much. We could make do with what we had because the basics we had. We had the, the cows, we had the meat, and we had the cream and the butter. And If we knew how to bake anything at all, we could do that. We were quite self-sustaining. What would be the negative aspects then? What aspects, please? Negative. Negative? The fact that you didn't get out to communicate or socialize very much. There was no, no socialization like we have this day and age that the kids are all getting together. We didn't do that. We didn't get to know all of the children. We knew those that were our immediate families or our immediate uh, neighbors, closest neighbors. But other than that, you didn't know the other kids. And were there different ethnic groups within the community? There were as far as, um, yes. We had the German Lutheran people who had different ways of cooking and fixing meals than the Catholic people did. For instance, um, what can I say as an example? There, oh, there were oh, there was a, a dish called strudla, which was a, made of flour and that sort of thing. Flour, eggs, and and you stretch the dough. The Lutherans did that. Catholics never heard of it, and to this day, when I speak of a strudla, the Catholic community doesn't people don't know what that is, because that was a Lutheran thing, and like the strudel that we have with the apple and the hung uh, and the cheese and that sort of thing that's hungarian the our german catholic people didn't know how to make that my mother never heard of it and never made it and so different foods went with different uh, ethnic groups they came from different villages in in russia different areas and that that's why they had the different dialects as well it was, there were at least one, two, three, four different dialects in just within a, a ten mile circumference where I lived. At least four. Was it difficult to understand them? Not really. 
but we always laughed about the one family because they, they were the only family that spoke the way they did. We would say, no, nah, for German, and they said, nay. And then we would, we as kids would laugh about that, you know, the way they talked. And then my dad would warn us, he said, someday, he said, each one of you is going to marry one of those. Phew, never. Well, guess what? We did. And so consequently, my husband would say, nay, and I said, no. You know, so, so he laughed many times about that. Um, were there any places that your parents wouldn't let you go? because of different ethnic groups or? Well, like, like I said, we would never be able to go to their church, ever. That was a no-no, you know. And we wouldn't dare have gone to, uh, with them to a dance or something like that. You didn't go with the Lutherans, the Protestants, I should say. And um, I'm going to transition just a little bit and so we can talk about holidays and celebrations. Uh, what was your favorite holiday growing up? My favorite holiday, I think, was Christmas. And can you explain or describe it for me? Because of the gifts. We always got a little gift, but we never, ever had a Christmas tree. When I saw the first Christmas tree, I wondered what that was all about. And I was in school then, you know. But uh, we had all the baked things. Mom did a lot of baking. And uh, you always had company during Christmas. Neighbors went to visit neighbors at Christmas time. You visited each group, visited each group. Each family visited the other families. And that was always nice. And then, like I said, we always had the candy and the nuts that were given to us. And, and uh, that was our uh, gift in the morning when we got up. There was a bag of goodies for each one on the table. We never saw Santa Claus, but we heard of what we called the Bilzenickel. And he was the mean one. And he, we were always threatened that if we didn't behave, he was going to come and get a big chain and, and take us along. And we could hear the chain rattle at Christmas Eve. Never saw him, but we heard the chain rattle. So we knew he was out there somewhere. Did it scare you? Yes. Oh, yeah, we were scared. Very scared. We didn't want him to come. Um, and can you describe a typical Christmas Eve? Christmas Eve was no different than you were just at home. We didn't have uh, Mass at our church on Christmas Eve. I remember one time as a child we came to Richerton where they had Christmas Eve, and I must have been probably eight. And then we uh, went for breakfast to this aunt that lived in town, and then we traveled home. So, But uh, at home we didn't have Christmas Eve services. And what kind of... Um food would your mother make for Christmas? Always had turkey or goose. Many, many times we had goose because she raised geese too. Or duck. We had ducks. And did your family also celebrate Easter? Celebrated Easter. And there there was a Holy Week that was the uh, impressionable time because always you had either stations on Friday night or Wednesday night, one or the other. And then a lot of prayer going on. We were getting ready. And then on Good Friday, we always had the service. Afternoon service. And then Easter Sunday. And what would you do on the Easter Sunday? Just go to Mass and come home. Have a dinner. Always had ham. Never failed. That was the Easter dinner, ham. Why was it ham? was tradition. That's all I can say about that one. It was tradition. I had ham for Easter and she baked it in a with a bread crust around it. So it was really good. And did they did they ever give you any gifts for Easter? No. No. About Except Easter when bunnies? No. But we had the Easter eggs, but like I said, my dad took us out and we chased the Easter rabbit. Never did catch him. What about the 4th of July holiday? There we usually had a big bang up time over at the church. It was like a picnic uh, at the church. I don't think we had any trees there, but uh, we had picnic lunch. Everybody brought picnic lunch and, and they uh, would shoot firecrackers and, and, and had races, had uh, ball games. They played horseshoe through horseshoes and, 
and uh, those were the games that they played. It was the horseshoe and the played ball. There were enough kids to play ball. And the men joined in with them. That was always the men played. Were those all day games? All afternoon, they usually came for a picnic lunch, and then you were there till about six in the evening, and then you went home. And what did you think the first time you saw firecrackers? I don't know what I thought. It was an amazement to see a firecracker, you know, or to hear a firecracker, I should say. We didn't have all the sparkly stuff, but they had some, you know. They must have all gotten together, I think, and, and uh, pooled their money and got some. Or probably took it out of the church fund, I don't know, but... Uh, it was a good time, but it was the getting together and playing you know, that was the most impressive. Were you ever in town to celebrate? No. 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 It was, all, was it always a church then? Always at the church. And what about birthdays? Did your family celebrate birthdays? With a cake. What kind of cake would your mother usually make? Angel food. And my older brother, Ralph, his birthday was on the 4th of November, mine was on the 3rd, so he'd all, we had to share a cake. But he'd always say, I get to lick the pan and he gets the cake. Is it a wonder that I didn't like him? <laughs> but learned to love him very, very much as an adult. Do you remember any of the gifts you, you would receive on your birthday? We didn't get gifts on birthdays. Never. Never. Did you always celebrate birthdays at, at your parents' house? At home. What about names days? Did that at home too. Just my dad's names day, not my mother's, but my dad's. That's uh, when she had a big, big dinner for the whole neighborhood. And then some. I don't know where they all came from. Would they have dances to celebrate too? Right. That's when they rolled back the carpet and one neighbor brought an accordion, the other one had the violin. And, and if he didn't have the violin, he took a comb and cigarette paper and must have whistled or, or hummed the tune through the cigarette paper. And it sounded, you know, almost like a, like a harmonica. Isn't that crazy? But it was true. <laughs> um, we had quite a, an upbringing. What about any other holidays that you remember, like New Year's or Halloween? Or Halloween, the boys went out and did their trick-or-treating. That's when we pulled the prank on him with the hanging dummy. The boys always were gone on Halloween. What did they dress up as? Oh, nothing. I mean, just gone. Mm -hmm. Each had a horse. And they rode to the neighbors, I suppose, and never questioned what they did. The worst they would have done was uh, stole watermelons or that sort of thing, or tipped the outhouse. That was the prank that they pulled was to tip out houses. How long would it take to put those back together? I don't know. They were just setting them up. Okay. You know, they were just sitting there. <laughs> um, and we talked a little bit about grade school and high school earlier. I'd like to touch a little bit on college, your college experience. Um, can you tell us about it a little bit? Well, I didn't go to any college until my oldest son was ready to go to college and we had Assumption College in Richerton, the Abbey. And so he started college and I started with him. But the only subjects I took were the accounting and the income tax accounting. So I only went the one year. And what did you think of it? Loved it. Loved it. I would have just liked to have gone on and had a lot of, you know, learning, but I didn't. Had the little one at home. She was four, our youngest. and So Leonard took care of her while I was going to school. And did you have a favorite memory from that time? Well, yes, I did, because another lady went to school with me, a neighbor lady, and uh, they marked on the curve. They graded on the curve at that time. Don't know if they still do that or not, but we graded on the curve. And the Abbey boys were so frustrated because the two women of us, we just had the top grade all the time. But I think a little experience in life and maturity played into it as well. It was easy to, for us to figure out a debit and a credit 
because you could see, we saw that, you know, saw that on our bank account or whatever. And, and uh, so it went like from an A to a C, you know, the boys never got more than a C where we had the big A's. They didn't like us, but we were just there one year or so. And what is the thing you least liked about it? I think what I least liked was to leave the little one at home, although she was in good hands. But I knew I had to do it because of the fact that I knew that there would be accounting to do on the farm as well as any other place. And then my husband was going to an agricultural school after he got out of the service, and he needed someone to do the accounting. Well, that was my job. I did the accounting for the farm. Was that a lot of work? Not when we started, because we had so very little to start with. But as time went on, now the last few years, there was the farm and there was the rent houses and there was the, the hunter's lodge and there was the Southway refrigeration and it was a lot and I did it all. Now, uh -oh. since you touched on the farm a little bit, I want to go back to that. I know, I shouldn't um, have done that. And talk about what a typical year would be like. So if you could take us from say the springtime, or you could start in the fall, doesn't matter, springtime into the winter, can you describe a typical year for us? First of all, you start with the winter in January, which is sometimes very difficult because of, well, now the travel is easy, but in our first years of marriage, it wasn't easy. And, uh, and that was kind of hard, and you kind of look forward to spring, to having the calves, and we had sheep, my husband and I, we always had sheep. And we had a, the sheep barn was located across the creek over here, and so it was quite a ways to go. But I would take my turn at night and go with a flashlight across the creek and go over there and check the sheep. Because if you didn't, one sheep may claim three lambs and the others don't want any. So then are, what are you going to do? You try to make them take those lambs and that sort of thing. But one person couldn't do it all alone, so we just took our turns. And so that was, but then later on they, uh, came the seeding. Could hardly wait to get out to seed. We didn't do fertilizer like they do now when we started. And uh, did the seeding, and then if the crop was a lot of weeds in it, then you did get somebody to spray it. And they usually did that with the big beams off their tractor and a big tank that they carried. So then we went through that, and we had the milk cows, and they were in the pasture, and we sold our cream. Until in the later years, we went into a, a, a grade A dairy and had 85 cows, and it was up to snuff at all times, believe me. He was such a perfectionist. We didn't even get to take the milk out of the bulk tank. We bought our milk because when the state would come out to take the bacteria count, he wanted his too low to read, and that's how our milk business went. We had the dairy farm until the boys grew up, and we had it one year after they left, and then we stopped. It was like a job 365 days a year, twice a day, unless it was leap year, it was one more, and so it went. But then we get into the uh, actual uh, haymaking. We didn't have all that equipment as we came along in the years as they have now, and that usually started about the 4th of July start cutting hay, and there was a, they put it up on stacks. There was no baling it, and that's how it was fed to the cattle. Again, pitching it, hauling a load by load. And then, of course, if we were lucky and didn't have any hail, we went into harvest, and that was either bindered, a binder cut it, and tied it into small uh, stacks, cut it quite long, you know, long stem. And then you'd had to go out and shock it, which was putting the pieces together, you know. And then when it came to harvesting, they threshed it with a threshing machine, which meant there was a lot of work for the woman in the house because the, the, they went in crews. Maybe three neighbors got together and did yours, and they did the next, and so on. So they came like even for breakfast, and you had to fix a big meal for breakfast, for lunch, and for dinner, and for supper, and it were late hours, you know, and it was uh, a hard time. 
but we were always happy to get that crop in. And of course came the turkey harvest after that, and, and when it got good and cold, then you did the butchering in the, and my mother canned a lot of, of the meat. And even in the summer, if they slaughtered a ewe that didn't uh, take her lamb, that uh, refused to do that, if she wasn't gonna raise a lamb, she was fattened and she was killed and she was put in jars. And so we always had good meat. She, my mother canned a lot. She canned chicken, she canned the, and when the, we had the springers, when they uh, got old enough to eat, we had chicken every day. Every morning we went out and butchered a chicken and had it ready by noon. Unless we had extra help, then we had to have two. But the, you can see with, what, four, five, six of us around the table, one chicken was enough. And I got the tail end, always, that was a piece I got. And you know, somebody else got away, and the boys always got two pieces because they worked harder than, than the little ones and us, so that's how that went. And after the butchering, what would happen? They would put the meat in the brine, of course, and, and uh, then smoke it and hang it in the granary. And then it was time for winter then? And then it was winter again. But there was a beauty of spring coming too. You know, everything came alive in spring. Snow would go away and the flowers would come and you had a lot of wild flowers that which I don't think we even have anymore as many of. There were daffodils out there that were wild. We had the bluebells, we had the crocuses and there were so many beautiful wild flowers. So that was the kind of the season. And anything else you want to add about that? that we have Not that I can think of. I'd like to talk a little bit about um, wrapping up your childhood memories and, and such. What was your most stressful childhood experience? My most stressful was probably, I would say, going to school the first time. You know, being faced with the unknown of, of the other children that were at school. You know, you had to acquaint yourself with those children, and that was hard. It was very hard going to school because we were so with our moms at home that not a day we're going to be away from you all day long it was hard. And I think that was probably the most stressful. And then when I went off to high school, I was only 13, and that was a very difficult time because the first thing they told me was, don't you think that you're going to come home every week because we can't afford to come and get you every week. You know, and that was hard. It was like they're almost abandoning me, and yet this is what I want. So in childhood, I was still a child. First thing that the principal said to me, you're too young to be in high school. You're only 13. Well, I'm here. And that kind of, kind of like, they're going to look down on me because I'm just young and little yet. So there were a few difficult times like that. Oh, and not only that, but the first week I was there, I got strep throat. I was so sick, so very, very ill, and the sisters took care of me. And it was really, really hard. And homesick, I was so homesick. If I could have walked home, I'd have walked home. But you you have the other women, girls that come and talk to you, and, you know, you just kind of get over that too. So... It was Those were the most formative years of my life, I would say, though, was those two years living with the sisters. Because there, too, we had to clean. We had our chores assigned. We had to make the dough. At a, at, I was good at that, boy, because I had learned that from home. And uh, the bread always turned out a little better when I made it because I knew when to throw a little extra cream in, which they didn't ever know. And uh, so there were many, many good things. And then the hard thing about staying with the sisters, every morning we got up at 5 o'clock. We had to get our basin or pitcher of water ready the night before into our basin. It was frozen solid the next morning. You're supposed to wash with this. Then we walked, what, five or six blocks to Mass at the Abbey. You could put pants on, but you had to take the pants off once you got into church. Then you had to have the dress, you know, no pants. And those were hard times was something that we, we didn't anticipate, I think, when I went there, that there was going to be all that 
going on. So, what would you think would be your most ha the happiest memory you have from your childhood? Oh, I just can't even. There were so many happy memories. The love I think that our parents showed. There was love everywhere. We loved each other, you know. And if you didn't love each other, you certainly got corrected and told that you had to do that. You know, there was no getting away with being mad for a whole day. You snap out of it and that's it. And I think the love that they showed us as growing up was a, was a big factor, even though they were very strict. You know, and I don't mean that they were uh, abusive. They weren't abusive, but they just had us in line just by looking at us, I guess. <clears throat> adventurous thing you did during your childhood? Well, I'll tell you what, there wasn't very much. But <laughs> the most adventurous thing was like, uh, I think the most adventurous thing to me ever was going sled riding. We had steep hills. Or going riding, we all rode horses, you know. Those were the most adventurous thing. There wasn't such a thing as going out to, for entertainment any place. You made your own entertainment. That was how our... Would, how would you prep? For a sled ride. How would you? Oh, you just bundled up really good because it usually was cold, and you just climb that big hill, and you get on your sled. We always had a nice big sled, you know, that the parents provided, and um, you just get on there and you come down, and you come down to the very bottom, and our dog picked it up and drug it back up, so we had that made. But that was adventure, especially some of the hills were much steeper than others. That and, was. And when you would go horseback riding, was there a specific horse that you would ride? Or? Oh, yeah. We all had specific horses. We, yeah. There were two or three that we could ride. Did you get your own horse, or did you share usually? No, we usually shared. shared. Yeah. And where would you go horseback riding? Just through the pasture and through the creeks and things. And probably see a coyote or, an, or a fox or something, you know. So or a hawk. Fairly enjoyable then. It, oh, yes. Very, very much so. You always see something new that you've never seen yeah, before. Yeah, you know, you'd always see either a, gro a groundhog or, a, or what are they? Prairie dogs. We had prairie dogs, and they'd sit and play on their little mounds of dirt, and uh, gophers or whatever. You saw something all the time. Snakes, and and uh, that was that was our growing up. That was farm life, and we saw a lot of things that the kids in town never even knew existed. So we felt pretty good about that when they when our cousins came from Seattle and we could tell them this and we could tell them that and and they didn't know anything about that. And is there anything else you want to add about your childhood memories? Not really. I don't think. I think I've I think I've covered it. You're probably so tired of listening to me. Well, in conclusion, why why do you think it's important to tell your life story? Oh, I think it's so important because how are our children going to know if we don't do it? And I'm so pleased that I am able to do this today, no matter whether it's, it's good or not good as far as the, the grammar and the uh, diction or whatever you might call it. It doesn't matter. That's, that's their heritage. We are their ancestors, and I think it's so important that we record that. I have never had the opportunity of doing that before. I have thought many times I should get a little recorder, and, and, but uh, it never happens. You don't have time. So today was a time that I really, really appreciate with you people. I do very much. Well, are there any other thoughts or observations that you would like to share with us? Not at this point, I don't think. I don't think I can think of any, but... <laughs>